Okay, I think we have uh, everyone joined. Uh, welcome everyone to the FluxNet Early Career Network Spring Workshop. Um, and here's your first host for the day, uh, Ling Meng. Take away, Ling. Hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining FluxNet Early Career Network Spring Workshop 2021. Uh, I, along with other FluxNet ECN committee member, will be your host for this event. Um, before we get started, I would like to know a little bit about you, our participant of this workshop. I have a live poll with only two questions. Uh, it's very simple. I dropped the link and the code in the chat. Please go ahead and answer these two questions. What best describe your career stage and describe your research topic in less than seven words? And we'll get back to it in just a few minutes. Okay, now I will uh, give you a brief overview of this workshop, uh, including agenda for today and tomorrow. And I will also talk a little bit about FluxNet ECN, who we are, what we do, and what our membership looks like. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put your question in the chat. The theme of this workshop is the intersections and alternatives of flux measurement, modeling, and remote sensing. This year, Ameriflux is launching the year of water fluxes. To promote the water fluxes year, we will focus on the water flux measurement in this workshop. We'll also discuss the interdisciplinary opportunities and the challenges for early career. Uh, specifically, this workshop serves the early career community by fostering um, interactions and collaborations, bridge the gap to experienced researchers by integrating students and early career actively into the discussion. Uh, we also provide the training opportunities. There is a Python course tomorrow to advance your Python skill. Uh, we bring together scientists with diverse backgrounds, remote sensing, modeling, and edit covariance to preliminary discussion. Last but not least, we are here to celebrate the year of water fluxes. Uh, we are FluxNet Early Career Network. This network aims to connect young and early career scientists working within the FluxNet community and regional networks. Currently, we have more than 500 memberships, consists of PhD students, that's around 50%, postdoc, that's around 24%, and other early career scientists from more than 50 countries. Okay, here is what our membership looks like. And now, if we come back to the live poll. I, I will re-put the uh, link and code of the live poll in the chat. And if you haven't, please uh, go ahead and um, answer these questions. Uh, okay, while well, we're waiting for the uh, results of the poll, um, we have a, a FluxNet website. Uh, this is our website. We will update our recent activities here and we write blog articles about young scholar interview. We also have a LinkedIn account. We are active on Twitter at FluxNet ECN. Subscribe FluxNet ECN mailing list and follow us on Twitter. Check out our website. 
So if you are not a member of Flagnet ECN, you are very welcome to join us. The Flagnet ECN is really um, a great platform for students and early career and researchers to ask questions regarding uh, research, field, career, and networking, and find funding opportunities. Uh, and during this two days workshop, if you have any thoughts you want to share on Twitter, please use the hashtag uh, ECN Spring Workshop 2021. Okay. Uh, now it looks like We got some results from the pool. Uh, most percentage come to graduate student and then postdoc and mid career. That's that's really diverse. Um, describe your research in less than five words. So evapotranspiration, remote sensing, carbon cycle, climate change, eddy covariance. Those are the words that come up. That's, that's really great. Uh, the organizing committee of Flexnet ECN and this workshop include Andrew, Fred, uh, Gabriela, uh, Teresa, and me. So this is really a great teamwork. Uh, if you have any questions and ideas for future Flexnet ECN activities, uh, feel free to let any of us know. And uh, we would like to give a special thanks to uh, AmeriFlex Management Project at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, Christine Gibato and Trevor for uh, their support and help. And we would like to thank Python course co-organizers at uh, Federal University of Parna, Lucas and uh, uh, Rafael, and our founders, founders uh, US Department of Energy. Okay, so in terms of the uh, agenda for today, we have four invited talks. Each talk is 20 minutes. And after each talk, we'll have 10 minutes Q and A. Um, feel free to ask questions uh, anytime here in the chat and we'll get them to speakers. The talk will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later. During the Q and A, everyone can unmute and turn on your videos to ask questions. And after the four talks, we'll have a 25 minutes breakout session. So we'll put people randomly into four breakout rooms for discussion. And this is a great opportunity for you to engage with the community, share your thoughts and ask questions. And it will be fun. After the breakout, everyone will come back to the main room and we'll have someone from each group report back uh, to your uh, group discussion. And tomorrow we'll have a Python course focusing on downloading and analyzing FluxNet data and data realization. Uh, please note this Python course is one hour earlier than today's webinar. It starts at 8 a.m. in the morning Pacific, but the Zoom invite is 9 p.m. So please do come at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, and Andrew, um, and his co-organizers will walk you through the fundamentals of Python and the very practical data analysis and visualization. And be sure to complete the skill level survey and download materials before tomorrow's workshop. And in today's breakout session, we have several topics for you to discuss, including the main theme, uh, 
and remote sensing and flux data that needed to improve model and vice versa. And uncertainty in the methodology and challenges in remote sensing water flux management. And if you have other topics you want to talk about and get feedback from the group, feel free to do that. And be sure to elect someone to report back your group discussion. This is important. And we'll do a group photo screenshot in the end. So be sure to stay till the end. Okay, now I will turn over to Teresa to introduce our first speaker. Hello everyone. Um, so we're gonna start with our two sets of, uh, of talks. So I would like to welcome our first speaker, Paul Stoy. Um, Paul is an associate professor in the Department of Wisconsin of uh, Biological System Engineering at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he, his research interests involve biosphere atmosphere exchange of mass and energy with an emphasis on modeling the processes that govern regional climate and long-term uh, CO2 and water flux in terrestrial ecosystem. So Paul's um, presentation today is entitled Using Eddy Covariance Energy Flux Measurements to Understand Atmospheric Processes at Multiple Scale. So Paul, uh, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for a nice introduction. Thank you for um, the invitation. I'm going to work through a lot of different material. I know that some of you have heard some of this before, and um, I will promise there is some new stuff about trying to use eddy covariance to understand atmospheric processes and really regional climate processes at multiple scales of organization from the tower site really to relatively large regions. Um, I have many acknowledgments, of course, uh, funding from different organizations, data from Ameriflux and Fluxnet, um, and the people. So I'll be talking about the master's research of Elizabeth Vick, the postdoctoral research of Dr. Tobias Gerken, who's now a professor at um, James Madison University, and Gabe Bromley, who is defending his PhD five days from today. Thank a number of other people, and once again, thank you for the invitation. And I'd also like to extend another invitation to everybody to another Fluxnet workshop, Land Atmosphere Interactions Workshop, which deals very strongly with the topics that we'll be covering today uh, in my talk and many other talks here. So this is around the Ameriflux site, and I truly encourage your attendance. It'll be fun. So what are we fundamentally talking about today? The idea that ecosystems aren't just passive actors that respond to climate drivers like radiation and precipitation and temperature. They're dynamic actors in the climate system by their water flux into the atmosphere and their heat flux, both of which combine to determine the diurnal course of the growth of the atmospheric boundary layer and its height. You can think of this as like the cloud base height, as well as what's called the lifted condensation level, right? This is the level up in the atmosphere that water is going to condense. A number of things we won't be talking about today, but are critical ways in which ecosystems impact climate are via biogenic volatile organic compound flux, their role in the formation of secondary organic aerosols, other aspects of atmospheric chemistry, including ozone dynamics, and then how the aerosols form cloud or congregate, aggregate to form cloud condensation nuclei, which also impact cloud dynamics. Then of course you get a feedback between the clouds and the radiation, or the precipitation, which then subsequently impacts ecosystem function in a dynamic and of course extremely interesting way. So what I'm going to do today is try to explain how ecosystems and land management have resulted in some very interesting and globally unique climate trends across relatively large areas of North America. A lot of the research in our lab is um, inspired by this figure, which is something I came upon when teaching one time and thought, huh, this is very interesting. Apologies for international and US audiences that this is in degrees Fahrenheit per decade, but from 1970 to this case 2014, you see a cooling trend across the Dakotas, right? This is North and South Dakota in the United States, which begs the question, why? Other seasons are not cooling, right? You see here winter with a slightly different uh, time window. Okay, that's getting warmer, but even with slightly different time windows, there may be a cooling. Either way, there's not a warming across relatively large parts of the United States. 
and we'd like to understand what those mechanisms are. We can also, especially in Fluxnet, ask the question, is there an extremely large country to our north and are simply the trends that we see here in the north central part of the United States part of a larger continental trend right in the center of the North American continent, including Canada, where we have an interesting cooling pattern. Here we have data from April, May, and June, 1970 to 2015, temperature, near surface two meter temperature trends in degrees Celsius per decade. What's happening and how can we use these? These are all Ameriflux at Ecovariance research sites, right? Judith Basin, these are from my lab, Fort Peck, these are from Tilden Myers and others. This is Lethbridge in Canada from um, Larry Flanagan's group, right? How can we use eddy covariance to help us understand these critical climate processes that are obviously involving heat and water? So um, we published a paper that better characterizes these trends over the past really four or five decades, where especially in May and June, we see a cooling. Okay, this is Saskatchewan, this is Montana in the US we see decrease critically in the vapor pressure deficit, right? Plants do not have to um, keep their stomata so closed anymore because there's more moisture in the atmosphere. This dramatically impacts crop growth and yield, right? And so we have more favorable conditions for plant growth with cooler and moister temperatures, especially in the early season, and actually quite a bit more rain, right? Millimeters per decade might not sound like a lot to many people in this audience, but in these dry land, especially these dry land cropping regions, this can make a difference between if a producer or a farmer is making money or not. So we have cool climate trends that aren't really happening in other places of the world. So this is the probability distribution of this two meter air temperature trend in what we're calling the Northern Great Plains or the Northern North American Great Plains. We have a negative trend cooling, whereas of course the planet is warming and we really want to know why especially because this region is a critical global breadbasket for key species, key crops, including wheat, right, as well as pulses like lentils um, and oil seeds like canola. Right? And this is also part of the world where yields are increasing, if not increasing rapidly, right? They're not stagnating or collapsing like many other parts of the world are with respect to wheat growth, and wheat is the, one of the most important sources, of course, of nutrient and protein to the human population. So we wanna understand this agroclimatology that's occurring in our cross boundary Canada plus US region. And also critique ourselves and ask, are we trying to cherry pick data where we find a cooling trend and say the world is not warming? This isn't what we're trying to do. May and June are very important periods for CO2 uptake by crops and other grasslands and forests and what have you that live in the northern plains. Um, their negative CO2 uptake, of course, with the Eddy Covariance Convention means that we're getting crop growth in the winter wheat in May and especially June and spring wheat, right? June is a very important time for its growth also as it happens July, right? So when climate is cooling is when crops are growing. And this is um, data from a paper we published a number of years ago now in agriculture, ecosystems, and environment, again with this Montana Judith Basin research sites. What do we think is happening? How can we use eddy covariance to better study this? So the Canadians, of course, have been studying this for quite a long time, and in the U.S. we've been a little bit deficient in studying Montana and the Dakotas, where not very many people live. Um, so in the Canadian prairies, right, the past four or now five decades, They've had a, yeah, in summer maximum temperatures by about a degree Celsius. They've had an increase in precipitation by about 10 millimeters per decade, similar to what Gabe Bromley found in his paper. And a radiative forcing cooling effect of six watts per meter squared. We can put that in the context of anthropogenic global warming since the um, industrial era, 1750, of only two and a half watts per meter squared. So this is a big effect that's been described in many papers, okay? And what a number of studies have argued is that the transition from bare soil to a vegetated surface has resulted in, right, more sensible heat flux under bare soil, less sensible heat flux under a vegetated surface, less latent heat flux under bare soil. There's no plants taking water from the soils into the atmosphere. That value of latent heat flux is increasing, right? Once you get something growing there, 
and a decrease in atmospheric boundary layer height, they're arguing here on the order of more than a kilometer, which looks like a lot. Okay. And sure, right, this is one of the ways in which ecosystems impact the atmospheric boundary layer, but why are we focusing on bare soil? That's not really a big deal, right? It actually in this region is. Historically and in many places still today, producers, right, farmers follow what's called the wheat fallow, summer fallow cropping sequence. They simply leave fields or left fields bare, bare ground, often treated with chemicals every other year in order to save that little bit of water in the soil, soil profile for subsequent crop growth the following year. Okay. And this isn't good for soil. This is a very windy part of the world. Soil is going to blow away. You get no inputs. You only have respiration, losing carbon. Ultimately, fallow is not sustainable. And the area that which, by which fallow has declined is about the same extent in both Canada and the US of my home state of Wisconsin. So these are hundreds of thousands of kilometers squared area that used to be brown dirt in the summertime is now covered with something. And this is going to have a climate effect, but how? Of course, we're gonna study this using eddy covariance. So this is a system that I won't be discussing in Sun River, Montana. This happens to be a particularly beautiful site where we have a young growing wheat crop. This is what fallow looks like. You can still see some stubble for the previous year. They oftentimes treat the field with chemicals to prevent weedy growth. Right? It's a very not good land management practice. And then we also have wheat fields. This looks brown because this is of course the harvest and the combine was driving right around the tower and the producers found that to be very fun. So we're trying to understand how different land cover types are impacting heat and moisture transport to the atmosphere. And the answer is of course, quite a bit. When you have cumulative evapotranspiration here just from April through September, when you have wheat fields, these are these colored bars, cumulative evapotranspiration in millimeters here. You have a winter wheat and spring wheat field that have over 50% more evapotranspiration than the fallow field, which is almost entirely simply evaporation. Okay, so plants make a difference and they do take water, of course, out of the soil and into the atmosphere, but then that evaporative cooling makes those surfaces less hot, as far lower sensible heat flux or H. And so the land surface is not as hot, not transporting as much heat that will rise and impact the atmospheric boundary layer over the course of a day. And so we have a cumulative sum of sensible heat flux that is far greater in our fallow field. Why is this important? Right? Because these things, like I mentioned, determine in part the dynamics of the atmospheric boundary layer as well as the lifted condensation level. So can a parcel of air rise so high that it condenses? That depends on how much um, buoyancy that particle has, which is determined both by its heat and also by its moisture. Moisture is also buoyant. So you can add those things together and calculate what's called the virtual heat flux and use that right in the model to lift a parcel of air until it reaches this daily maximum and model that as the atmospheric boundary layer height and also calculate the lifted condensation level as what we call a necessary but not sufficient condition for convective precipitation. In other words, if a parcel rises and condenses, you might get a cloud, but if it rises and can't condense, you won't get a cloud. Okay. And this framework has been studied by many different groups as a simple way of understanding land atmosphere connections. And we're taking it here to land management atmosphere connections. So this is another figure from the paper by Vic and others. And this is showing the difference in boundary layer height. Oh, actually we're calling it H. Okay. The difference in boundary layer height when you're going from um, a wheat field to a fallow field and finding that almost a kilometer difference you can get in model world, right? If you're lifting imaginary parcels of air that are being heated and moistened by either a wheat field or a fallow field. Okay, so this is almost like an end member of how much the land surface can impact the atmosphere. And you'll immediately notice that this is a little bit different than assumed by Gameda and others, but still isn't a full story. We want to know more. Here, we're using data from Fort Peck, which is in Northeastern Montana, right? In the Native um, American nation, Fort Peck, uh, where um, we can compare it immediately against radio sound observations, as well as other observations from the Glasgow, Montana National Weather Service site called GGW. 
So when we do that, and here we're looking at trends from MERA2, okay, which is a reanalysis data product that's estimating sensible and latent heat flux, and their ratio, the Bowen ratio, you can see as land cover has changed, as many studies on this in this region, you, we have a decrease in sensible heat flux, an increase in latent heat flux, the different colors are different months, and the decrease in the Bowen ratio from about one. This is one part of the Northern Plains where land cover change is having a relatively large impact on surface fluxes. What we did right, is we coupled those with these radiosonde observations to find as well, and the reanalysis data, to find as well that there has been a decrease in the moisture lapse rate. In other words, because there's more moisture at the surface, Right. The rate of change of moisture as you get higher in the atmosphere is becoming more negative because there's more moisture down here near the surface. I hope you guys can see my cursor. So we have a more negative moisture lapse rate and we have a lower Bowen ratio. Temperature lapse rate isn't actually changing very much. We then use a mixed layer model from Porporado um, to link these flux data and the profiles and calculate how much crossing we get between the atmospheric boundary layer and lifted condensation levels. This model right, is analytically tractable. It's what Bob Milkery does. He's the professor at Princeton now. Um, where these four parameters, right, the lapse rates of temperature and moisture, as well as surface temperature and moisture, that is virtual temperature, is that theta, is forced by a diurnal cycle of radiation that's assumed to be constant, the cycle is constant, as well as the Bowen ratio, which is assumed to be constant during the day. We can then calculate, right, these crossings as mentioned before, a necessary but not sufficient condition for convective precipitation which now, as you can see, is also a function of the Bowen ratio. And when we're taking different decades, okay, this is kind of the 70s to mid 80s in that dark blue, mid 80s to mid 90s in the dark red, you see that there was not a lot of convective likelihood, right? not a lot of opportunities for convective precipitation to form um, in the 80s and 90s. And nowadays, right, things are, there's, more than 50% of days, you have the chance of having convective rain. And that's a big difference. You also notice a sensitivity of this crossing to the Bowen ratio, especially once you get very wet, once you get a lot of latent heat versus sensible heat, really below the level of about 0.5. Recalling before that the land surface trend observations only went from about a Bowen ratio of two to one. So in other words, okay, we have determined that you, we have a sensitivity. Oh, we have a question here. Um, Sorry, that was just me reminding folks. No, okay, cool. Uh, there's a sensitivity of right convective precipitation to land surface conditions, but obviously from this figure, something else is happening. Okay, it's not just the land surface alone that's causing what amounts to a relatively large change in the amount of precipitation that these regions have received. So this is a moving average of precipitation in northeastern Montana, May, June, and July from the 70s, right? We had a drought period in the 80s and somewhat 90s. And now we have three times more rain in May, this is already about a decade ago, um, than we used to. Okay, so is the land surface change alone enough? And how can we learn more? We can run weather models that are now so big because of supercomputers that we can make them climate models. So convective precipitation is extremely important, especially in summer times in the Northern Plains. We need a weather and climate model that can explicitly resolve these convective processes. And what people at um, uh, NCAR and other places have found is once you have a grid cell of four kilometers or less, Right. You can explicitly resolve convective precipitation processes instead of having to parameterize them and kind of estimate when convection might occur. You can actually model it directly. And this is what Gabe Brownlee is doing for his PhD thesis, is taking a very large region, most of North America, much of North America, and focusing in right, and running at about 20 kilometers a weather model there, and then taking this weather research and forecasting model at four kilometers over multiple years under different land management scenarios and trying to understand how the land surface has impacted precipitation. 
So from before, right, there's been a lot of change in bare ground. This is from a Landsat study by Song and others in Nature. You can see this is Saskatchewan, this is North Dakota. We have a big greening of our area. This is overlapping very strongly with where wheat is produced spatially. Okay, so a lot of change in the wheat management system that we think is important to climate. What we did, and this is this third scale, right, of using eddy covariance data to improve our understanding of atmospheric and climate processes, is we took some nice observations from the CA LET, the Left Ridge Grassland eddy covariance site, and we compared our modeled sensible heat flux and latent heat flux against those observations. And you see there are some challenges with the model, but for the most part, right, the slope and the fit isn't that bad, especially given that we're forcing this whole thing, right, with reanalysis data from the globe, but far away, and having it create weather, right, of course, that's related to fluxes, and then taking those against the observations. So there are many ways in which this can go wrong, and I was pretty heartened to see that to a first order, right, the land surface model, which happens to be called NOAA-MP, is simulating sensible latent heat fluxes relatively well. What are the major model results? More vegetation is cooling air temperature near the land surface, right? By up to a, about a degree and a half Celsius. Okay, so this is a relatively large change and it's a very strong function of the change in what the model calls F veg, which is the vegetation fraction within each model pixel. So land cover change is impacting temperature. It's also lowering vapor pressure deficit. So as you have more vegetation, they're adding more moisture to the atmosphere, which coupled with lower temperatures, which will decrease the vapor pressure deficit, right, is doubly making vapor pressure deficit lower. Apologies, these dark colors actually mean that the surface is wetter. I'm trying, we need to flip these axes before we publish this um, in order to let people know, right, how much land management impacts climate over relatively small as well as relatively large areas. But when we run the model right, with precipitation, land cover change alone between a fallow scenario and the control scenario without any fallow, it doesn't change precipitation by all that much at all. Okay, there's some differences, but it's not explaining the massive precipitation differences that we see. These appear to be more consistent with additional moisture transport from what's called the Great Plains low level jet. Okay, this is, um, at about 850 hectopascals, so a little bit up in the atmosphere, especially at nighttime, right, this jet is transporting a lot of moisture into our region. So this is meridional moisture transport right here in V. Right, these positive numbers mean it's going north. So you have a northward motion of something that also has a lot more Q, right, a lot more specific humidity. So we have more moisture entering our region, which is helping determine these pretty big changes in precipitation that we see. And this is part of a relatively large change of the hydrology of the entire North American continent. This is from a study in Rodell, I believe it's in science. Uh, groundwater observations from the GRACE satellite, which measures gravity. Um, one of the areas of the world that's adding moisture to its soils and ecosystems is the Northern Plains. Right? They are assuming it's a progression from a wet to dry period. You can see the Southern Plains are drying out in part due to moisture depletions of the Oglala Reservoir, or the aquifer, okay, aquifer depletions with irrigated agriculture, mostly non-irrigated agriculture where we are, way wetter now. Okay, and there's almost a dipole in how much moisture trend has changed right through the center of North America. And the story is more to do with just wheat and fowl management. We just published a paper in Global Change Biology that's also explaining a lot of vegetation greening in places like Montana that's additionally due in part to savannification or the growing of trees where there used to just be grasslands. So big changes all around. To summarize, okay, with land cover change, has cooled regional climate, the model is pretty consistent about that. Convective precipitation is coupled to land surface function, especially early in the growing season. This is some details of what Tobias Gherkin found. Land cover change alone can explain the increase in precipitation, which is due in part to global change consistent, larger scale climate processes. There's more energy to transport more moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and places south of us, which is one of the reasons that we're seeing our climate change. Um, eddy covariance is critical to helping us understand and help validate models. 
And the different approaches that we use for understanding how they did so give us progressively more nuanced insight into how this system works. And ultimately, right, land management is changing climate, which changes in turn land management. Okay. And it's an active area of study of trying to bring these two systems together, the climate system and the human system, which are coupled. And it's up to us, and especially you, the young scientist, to figure out how we can do this better. So that's what I had. I want to say thank you very much for your attention. And in my understanding, I hopefully there's still some time for questions. Yeah, thank you so okay, much. So for, uh, yeah, so we'll go over the questions that are that are in the chat. So yes. Samantha uh, is asking is asking how soil moisture irrigation management playing role in the land uh, atmosphere feedback and cooling trend in the Great Plains, mm -hmm. and how the Great the uh, Great Lakes region is different than other parts of the USA in terms of coupling. Yeah, Samantha, thanks so much for that. That's a really interesting question. So um, there are similar and different things happening. Our region is predominantly not irrigated. Okay, the irrigation really starts in Nebraska and places further south. There's a little bit of irrigation, but it's not the dominant way that people manage the land. However, right, many studies in the central Great Plains, which is much better studied than our region, have demonstrated very clearly how irrigation in places like Nebraska downwind in places like Iowa and Wisconsin meaningfully impact precipitation patterns by adding more moisture to the atmosphere. Um, this is now coupled with an increase in the strength of the Great Plains low-level jet, which is bringing moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and then picking up moisture from the South Central and Central Great Plains and other ecosystems and bringing it to us, which is one of the reasons that the Great Lakes states like Wisconsin, Michigan, have seen such an increase in precipitation. Now, that being said, there's also the mesoscale convective systems, which I didn't have time to talk about today. These are large scale convective systems that bring about plus or minus half the rain to the Great Plains. Um, and these are initiated oftentimes in places like Montana, and they propagate almost always eastward to places like Wisconsin, where we live. I know the Simons is here in Wisconsin. So um, that MCS, mesoscale convective system, coupled with more moisture from the jet are creating what amounts to a very different hydrometeorological situation in the Great Lakes states and also the Northeastern United States as well as Eastern Canada. We need to disentangle right, how the formation of mesoscale convective systems and their propagation interact with Right, these things aren't opposed, but how they interact with more moisture from irrigation in the Great Plains jet to better figure out how the entire system is working, which obviously is quite complicated. Um, hope that that was sufficient because I see a few other questions I hope to get to, um, including by Santosh about results for winter and spring wheat contribution to cumulative ET. Um, after harvesting wheat, yeah, so you still have evaporation after you harvest the wheat. And in fact, one of the years there was quite a bit of evaporation because there's a large precipitation event that happened after the harvest. Um, so there's not major evapotranspiration losses, you're right. But something I was surprised about to be perfectly honest from these measurements was that there is more evaporation from fallow than I would have anticipated. Okay, so if there's no crop, the soil is getting extra hot, right? It's getting really hot and that heat is moving down and that heat is helping to evaporate the water that's in lower levels of the soil. We haven't really studied that interesting process explicitly, but it was not what I expected. So I really appreciate that question because it helped emphasize that things are really more nuanced when it comes to soil evaporation. And here I see Amy. I'm going kind of quickly because I know I'm a little bit over time. Um, Amy's parents on a farm in Saskatchewan. This is great. Trends, the winters not have as much precipitation as before. Yes, um, with a lack of precipitation. So, I mean, this is, this is really an awesome question for a number of reasons. Um, and I wasn't able to get into these, but what's happening in effect is pl in places like Montana, they're very dry, more moisture is good. But in places like Manitoba, maybe parts of Saskatchewan, where it's not quite so dry, they've had some very severe flooding events at the Red River of the North a few years ago um, that have meaningfully impacted people's ability to plant. So there's an opposite side to the coin of more precipitation. In a lot of places we can see this as a good, but in other places it really isn't. 
And this winter melt dynamic is, is of course really critical here. The rate at which things melt, right, very fast, you're just gonna get a lot of liquid water going into places where there's a lot of still ice water, which can create damming on rivers and create flooding. So um, yeah, this is, um, we personally don't think um, that the winter melt impacts the cooling so much because the cooling is mostly in May and June but it does really impact the ability of farmers to get seeds in the ground because of uh, too much flooding during the planting season. So there's an interaction. Um, and Renato, it's great to hear from you. We don't see tons of changes in clouds and radiation, okay, uh, actually, but, uh, even though we thought okay, So that's probably about time that I have. Yeah, okay. we're gonna go back to this question at the end, so. All right. Yeah, so we're gonna move. Uh, thank you, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Thank you guys, it was so much fun giving a talk to everyone. Yeah, right. uh, so we're gonna move to our next speaker for today, uh, Jacob Nelson. So Jacob is a doctoral uh, researcher with the Model Data Integration and uh, Global Diagnostic Modeling Groups at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry. Uh, his research focuses on coupling water and carbon fluxes to constrain estimates of transpiration. So you're most welcome, uh, Jacob. Uh, Jacob is presenting today uh, water flux partitioning for eddy covariance data. Jacob, please, uh, you can start. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and I put a link to the chat, uh, a, look, a link in the chat of, uh, yeah, the presentation with the speaker notes, which you can see, which is, is supposed to, and you can click on links and some things are interactive. So feel free to, to play with this a bit, uh, even as I go. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction, the opportunity to be here. Um, I will say that I, I submitted the last uh, copies of my thesis a few hours ago. And so my brain is still uh, processing everything. So if I'm a bit scattered, that's, that's why, and I apologize. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the uh, evapotranspiration partitioning at eddy covariance. So I, I guess we're all familiar with eddy covariance systems. Um, and when we talk about evapotranspiration partitioning, uh, we want to really um, kind of build off of the successes we've had uh, with the carbon fluxes. So taking the net ecosystem exchange and partitioning that to what's the gross primary productivity and the ecosystem respiration. And we want to do the same thing with uh, the water fluxes. So take the, the latent energy or the total evapotranspiration uh, and say, what is the biologically controlled transpiration and what is the abiotic evaporation from canopy water or from, from soil moisture. Um, and the reason for wanting to do this comes uh, from, in, in one part, kind of the unconstrained uh, global uh, transpiration estimates we have. So here's, uh, I've compiled kind of some studies. Um, we've got kind of upscaled site estimates. So taking site estimates published in the literature and upscaling them in different ways. Uh, global isotope studies, uh, remote sensing-based estimates, and then uh, process-based models. Uh, this is from CMIP5. They see a, a big spread in the in the total global transpiration to evapotranspiration radio ratio. I mean, it can only be between zero and one hundred percent, and we range almost that full range. Um, and in the process models, tend to be much lower than than everything else, than particularly the site upscaled. Um, Whereas these are saying something around 60%, they're saying more like 40%. So they're not even agreeing on what's the dominant flux. Um, so we'd like to, to kind of get some, some more information in here to try, try and constrain some of this uncertainty. Um, so possibly one, one issue is that transpiration is really difficult to, to estimate uh, and, and differentiate that flux uh, at a large scale. So if you're working with an ecosystem, it's really hard to say, Okay, all these leaves are doing one thing and the soil is doing something else when the drivers are all the same, you know, as opposed to the carbon fluxes where you have temperature driving respiration and, and light driving uh, photosynthesis, uh, transpiration and evaporation have basically the same drivers. One is just has this biological control. Um, so Bill Schlesinger uh, had compiled 81 studies and he did, this, he did this by basically anytime he read a study where, where there was partitioning, he put it in a file. Um, and so some of these studies go back to 1941. Um, so 81 studies is not very much uh, over basically 100 years. Um, and if you jump forward four years, uh, this other study uh, by Leon et al. 
2018, they were constraining the CIMIP, CIMIP-5 models using only 33 studies. Um, so constraining global transpiration with, with just 33 studies. Uh, and I don't want to pick on these on these studies. It's just there's not a lot of data out there that really integrate the full ecosystem that can bridge this scale. Um, so that's really the potential of using uh, eddy covariance data and FluxNet is that you have uh, several hundred sites, uh, many different ecosystems and spanning uh, many years. And so I mean, it's already shown to be very powerful. And if you could do this with transpiration, I think you could really constrain some of this global uncertainty. Um, so that's uh, kind of how I see it uh, in, in the broad sense. Um, we have lots of research that goes on at the leaf level, the stomate level, um, and even the plant, plant level with things like uh, set flux uh, in, in basically estimating water fluxes from plants. Um, and I would say the the kind of current paradigm is that uh, these understanding of, of leaf scale, uh, things like a ball berry model that are modeling some model conductance, those are transferred kind of directly to the regional and global scale with remote sensing and, and process based models. Um, and, and that's a pretty big jump. Um, and what we'd like to do is, is get transpiration from any covariance data to kind of bridge this gap. And then we can have these, these kind of smaller scale. Uh, transfers in the future and really get a better understanding of how does a whole ecosystem respond to something like drought rather than just an individual leaf or even an individual plant, um, because these are much more complex. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through some practical things. Um, basically, I'm going to look at three uh, ET partitioning methods that we've tested and, and played around with a bit. Uh, the underlying water use efficiency method, the Presprego method, and the T method. Um, yeah, Presprego and, and T were both developed at our institute, uh, and the underlying water use efficiency was, was developed by Sha Tzu uh, a few years ago. Uh, and all of these methods are only using the core eddy covariance data. They're not using any other set flux or leaf level measurements, and that's to get as broad applicability as possible. Um, so that's really the idea behind these approaches. Um, so the first one I'll go over is, is the underlying water use efficiency. Um, this, uh, the, the equations aren't showing up, but the, basically you have uh, this GPP times square root VPT divided by ET. So this underlying water use efficiency, this square root VPT term really linearizes the, the relationship. Um, and then you, you kind of make two estimates. One is this kind of UWEP. Uh, this is a 95th percentile regression, and this is really saying what is the maximum carbon gain uh, to water loss that we get. Uh, so this is half hourly data for a whole year, uh, and we're saying this is where the transpiration is going to be. This is where transpiration is going to dominate the flux, uh, and then we can take for each day or, or each half hour uh, a normal regression uh, and, and get uh, a ratio of those two slopes, which gives us our T over ET. So you can see as, as you look at different days, uh, this, this underlying water use efficiency related to transpiration stays the same. And, and these daily values change um, to, to give you a different uh, T over ET ratio. Um, the next approach is uh, the Presprego method. This is probably the most complex. Um, it has a, a big leaf model with four different parameters. Um, and these are fit using the, the meteorological and the GPP data. Um, and you end up with a still model conductance uh, estimate. And from that still model conductance estimate, um, you predict transpiration. Um, and these parameters are fit in a five-day moving window. Um, and they utilize also this uh, optimality, maximizing carbon gain to water loss um, in, the, in the cost function, which is pretty novel. Um, and so this would be something similar to, to the daytime partitioning of GPP with these light response curve uh, parameters fit in these five-day moving windows, um, a, a little bit more complex. Um, and yeah, you can see how these, these parameters can change in time, uh, which compensate for how ecosystems change uh, throughout the season. And then finally, there's the, the T method, the transpiration estimation algorithm. Um, so this works uh, by taking the eddy covariance data, uh, removing periods when it's supposed to be wet, uh, and then isolating, okay, the surfaces are wet, uh, the plants are active, 
This is then a, a training data set for a machine learning uh, algorithm, a random forest in this case, um, which predicts water use efficiency um, and kind of makes this assumption that, you, that transpiration is dominant during some time periods of this, uh, of this training data set uh, so that this water use efficiency is really just uh, GPP over transpiration. Uh, and from this, we can estimate the transpiration. Um, so you can see this is uh, just GPP to ET. Uh, and if we pick a day, you can see this uh, machine learning is, is kind of inferring what is the, what is the response throughout the day. Um, these nonlinearities with, with vapor pressure deficit and drought and whatnot. Um, and all of these methods, uh, you can, you can look if, if you want to apply them. There's um, some tutorials and, and whatnot online. So uh, yeah, these are all open and, and you can use them whenever you want. If you need help, just email me. I'm happy to, to help guide people through that. Um, so just to recap, we have the underlying water use efficiency method, method utilizes this square root QPD linearization of the water and carbon fluxes does make the assumption that transpiration equals ET during some time periods. Uh, it's the easiest to calculate and it's pretty straightforward and it's, yeah, it's really easy to just run this uh, for any data set. Um, Presprego is, is the big leaf model with optimality. This is the most complex. It doesn't make the, the assumption that transpiration equals evapotranspiration. Um, and this is pretty computationally uh, intensive to, to estimate all these parameters. Uh, and then T um, utilizes machine learning. It also makes the, the T equals ET during some periods assumption. Um, but other than that, it makes the fewest assumption on the physiology. Uh, so it's the most data-driven. Um, so then we've taken these three methods and uh, kind of, they've all been previously published. They have their own publications. They've done some, some evaluation, uh, but we wanted to take them and, and look at an independent data source. So we looked at, uh, SEP flow uh, upscale to canopy scale from SEPFluxNet. Um, here's one side in the Netherlands, um, and we see the three transpiration partitioning methods, and then the original evapotranspiration from any covariance and the SEP flow. Um, and what you get is that the transpiration methods end up being much more uh, correlated to the SEP flux than just the evapotranspiration, which is kind of a good, good sign that we're, we're doing better than the, the bulk ET. Uh, we're getting something closer to the biology um, and all of them are really doing i mean depending on the site and the year they, they're all doing pretty similar as far as the correlation um however we can look here's now six sites um and and in each case the the correlation is quite good um, and the and the bias is also better than et but they're, they're quite different uh, especially at some sites um, where the presprego and the, the underlying water is efficient efficiency methods tend to have much lower magnitude of transpiration, something on the order of 45 to 50% of evapotranspiration. And the T method is a bit higher, something closer to 70, 75. Um, but outside of just independent uh, validation, we also just looked at what kind of patterns do we get? Do we get the patterns we would expect? Um, so here we're looking at the daily mean vapor pressure deficit uh, compared to the water use efficiency from the three methods, as well as calculated with just evapotranspiration. Um, and you see this kind of much better response of, of water use efficiency going up as vapor pressure deficit goes to zero. Um, with the Presprego, it's, it's pretty hard coded in that big leaf model. So you get this very theoretical response. Uh, and in the other two, you get a, a more muted, but also this, this nice response, whereas when you look at evapotranspiration, you don't get it at all. Um, and this is because of, of this trade-off that uh, as you decrease VPD, surfaces are more wet and actually uh, there's more evaporation. And so that's kind of compensating that the, the, the T over ET ratio is decreasing while the water use efficiency is increasing. So if you just take evapotranspiration, you don't get any of that effect. Um, whereas all the partitioning methods are able to pick that up. Um, Furthermore, we can look at uh, the LAI. Um, so a lot of people like to look at this relationship that uh, as LAI increases, the T over ET ratio should also increase. 
Um, so this is these black lines are from the uh, way at al 2017 that fit uh, parameters based on, on literature data um, relating LAI to T over ET uh, for different plant functional types. Uh, we looked at the same plant functional types with FluxNet data. And we see, well, we get a, a really nice uh, similar relationship with like broadleaf forests and crops, which have a very distinct kind of vegetation dropping or being removed um, with other uh, plant functional types such as like savannas or grasslands um, where maybe you have a lower uh, LAI, you have a seasonality to the vegetation, but it's actually uh, not as much affecting the, the transpiration because it's due to drought and, and it's not so much just a dropping of vegetation due to phenology. Um, so, it, and this is this is a bit different than I think uh, the current paradigm. Um, so if we look at the Leanne at L2018 paper that is analyzing the CMIP5 data, uh, they did an analysis that what are the, the key drivers of, of T over ET from the CMIP5 models. And overwhelmingly, they, they were all saying LAI is the key driver. So basically, if, if there's vegetation, then transpiration should be high. If there's not vegetation, transpiration should be low. Um, but when we are able to apply uh, these transpiration estimation uh, methods to FluxNet, it gives us you know, 200 sites uh, with complete site years of transpiration and evapotranspiration. So we can get a, a mean uh, site T over ET. Um, and when we did that, we then looked at what are the spatial drivers in FluxNet of T over ET based on, on these different partitioning methods. Uh, and what we found was a bit different that uh, kind of the key spatial driver was was crop designation, which makes sense because that's harvest that's that's got a, a lot more uh, disturbance that, that's going to really impact T over ET, like, like Paul was talking about. Um, then minimum LAI, which has to do with, with seasonality, that do you, do you completely drop everything or uh, are you more evergreen? And then what was really interesting is that the soil properties started to show up. Um, and these are from soil grids, so they're not the best characterization of what's really in the in the field, but but they still came out as as key drivers of T over ET, which which makes sense. I mean, how plants are accessing water uh, and how water is retained is much more important than uh, than maybe is there vegetation or not. Um, and then yeah, things like uh, NDMI, so uh, uh, remote sensing based moisture index. So then getting into drought. Uh, so. I think really these water dynamics are much more important than, than maybe just uh, is there vegetation or is it a forest or these kinds of things, um, which, which to me makes sense and, and maybe can uh, kind of give an idea of where to, where to put the research and how an ecosystem is, is partitioning these water fluxes. Um, so to kind of come back to um, that original concept of, of using this ecosystem-based uh, uh, transpiration as a, as a bridge between you know, these in-depth studies, uh, really using leaf and plant data and these global uh, studies, and we want to kind of make this future scale transfer. So that's something we're, we're working on currently um, in the sense of Fluxcom. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with Fluxcom, it, it basically takes the the flux data uh, and pairs it with remote sensing and gridded meteorological data. Uh, and then from using machine learning uh, predicts global gridded products of carbon and energy fluxes. Um, so there's been a lot of work with that. Um, in, in the last couple of years, we've been kind of revamping it and rebuilding it from scratch. I'm really making sure all the quality control is there, the satellite data is there, um, and the, the functionality is much more flexible. Um, and in part of this, uh, because we now have the partitioned water fluxes, we're, we're going to want to also do that with 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 the partitioned water fluxes to see uh, what kind of how can we what are the global patterns and and how can we then uh, yeah influence other remote sensing and process based models uh, to kind of characterize what is really the the global patterns of these things. Um, so here was uh, kind of an initial result. Um, it's not published. It's not something that we would want to distribute, but I, I think it gives us a nice first look into what the, the global T over ET would look like with a data-driven product. 
we get this higher T over ET. Um, so maybe something around 70%. Um, and yeah, I, I think this will be improve and, and yeah, we'll, we'll have a nice product here in the next years, well, months, we'll see. Uh, so some kind of key takeaways. Um, so overall, we have these three partitioning methods and there are more uh, out there, um, but they tend to agree well. I think they're doing, uh, they're getting closer to the physiology. They're matching well with the independent data. They're matching well against each other, but the, really the biggest uncertainty is the magnitude uh, that it's still difficult to constrain. So that they're really good at, at showing patterns, showing variability, but uh, the absolute value still needs a lot more work to, to validate. Um, but I think it has a lot of potential to bridge this scale. Um, and then we can link it to things like uh, how is directly is the plant, our plants uh, affecting global processes and, and the global water cycles and carbon cycles. Um, so I, we're really excited about that. Um, yeah, and so hopefully we'll, we'll get something out. Uh, and with that, I want to thank all my co authors and yeah, everyone who participated. This is, it takes a lot of work to get all this data together. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jacob, for this interesting presentation. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, so Ben is asking, so first Jacob, this is a really great, uh, really great. So do you have a sense of how dry a site must be to use? Uh, so I think I missed the question. Uh, how do, so first, yeah. Uh, how do you see your method being sensitive to NEE partitioning and GPP and RECO uncertainties? Yeah, that's the first question. Yeah, so I mean, obviously these partitioning methods are already building on a large processing chain. Um, actually, have it up. Um, but basically what we did uh, an analysis of basically using the daytime partitioning and the nighttime partitioning, they got really similar results. That is in T, the transpiration estimation algorithm, because uh, some of the effects tend to cancel out because you're kind of using this, this, um, this carbon flux to constrain the patterns in the water flux. But then you, like you estimate a water use efficiency and then you times by GDP again and then it goes out. But of course, differences in pattern do show up. Um, so it definitely adds to the uncertainty of the transpiration estimate. That's how we're, that's how we're doing is that we're linking it to the carbon cycle. It's a good point to keep in mind. Okay, so another question from Ben. Uh, do you have a sense of how dry a site must be to use the TA method and equivalence? Uh, are we talking hours after a rain or a near surface soil moisture below a certain dryness threshold, like beyond field capacity? Actually, this was the big uh, assumption that, that, that people were thinking, okay, it's the amount of evaporation that's really going to bias because it's an easy assumption. But what we found through kind of initial um, experiments where we use models and we ran the, the machine learning on the model, so everything's known inside the model. Um, and we three different models with very different evaporation rates, from very little total evaporation uh, to very high total evaporation. And um, the amount of evaporation wasn't so much the issue, it was the frequency of evaporation. So we have the half hourly data. It's really, okay, it's gonna rain, we filter those periods out, the period after rain, we're gonna filter those out. Um, and then kind of after that, throughout the day, we have enough periods where transpiration is really dominating uh, to characterize the water use efficiency. Um, and, and then make a prediction. So I think even in fairly wet sites, if you have enough data, it does a pretty good job. Um, of course, wetland sites or something like that, you're going to have difficulty because you're always going to have a lot of evaporation unless you have a very close canopy. But I think, I think it's not a, a limit of how dry a site needs to be. I think it's, if you have enough dry periods, if you're looking at these, training data, 
characterize it. And actually, magnitude differences we see is not from the from the uh, from this assumption. It's actually the assumption that you get the most transpiration out per unit carbon. That that's what's having the impact of this other assumption. Thank you. Uh, so we have also another question from Samantha. Uh, what methods were used to partition NE to get GPP and uh, respiration? How the heterotrophic respiration part was sorted out? Sorted out? These were all uh, using the FluxNet product, so uh, kind of standard one flux processing. Um, and typically, I was using nighttime um, estimates. Um, GPP, that's the, the, the key buy in for these. But we were also uh, estimating with the daytime and getting very similar results. Um, so, yeah, it, it wasn't having as big of an impact. Uh, which, which partitioning method for GPP and NE uh, you were using? But, yeah. Yeah, we have one, one more question uh, from Yanni. What is the difference between uh, ET calculation by CBAL model and methods uh, you are discussing? Between the CMIP models? Uh, CBAL, S E B A L. Okay. I'm not I think in this case, if this is a, a process-based model, we're really taking a, a, a complementary approach of, of kind of building up from, from in a more data-derived way, uh, kind of building off data-driven models up to a global level rather than putting all the processes in. So it gives you a different perspective of what is the data saying compared to what do the processes say. Um, and I think there's, there's a disconnect there at the moment. So hopefully this is able to bridge that gap and we can learn a bit more about the other. Okay, we, uh, we have one more question from Jeremy. Uh, your initial results uh, map seem to have some places without estimates, particularly on the coast like the southern US. Is that due uh, to a lack of Flexnet sites or satellite data? It, it's the satellite data. So the models are, are ran on the Flexnet sites. You, you generate the model. Uh, and then the model is just forward run with whatever inputs you have. So the, I'm, this is kind of initial results, not super clean. Um, so this is going to be due to some issues with the quality of the, of the inputs. Um, so satellite data. And these are things that in building the second generation of Fluxcom, we want to kind of solve a lot of these things, get the, the highest quality remote sensing data. And, and hopefully a lot of these things will clear up. Okay, um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, so now we're done with our first uh, first session of, of talks. So we're gonna have a, a 10 minutes break and we're gonna, we're gonna be back at uh, 10, 20 uh, Pacific time. Thank you, everyone.
Should I set up my screen already? Yep. Um, I think it's um, 21 past um, the hour, so we should probably uh, get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, we hope you, you've had, uh, you've been able to at least move around a little, so you're refreshed for the second session of uh, today's seminar. Um, for this session, we're going to have another um, two talks. Uh, first, we would uh, go over across the Atlantic to Reading in the UK and to Pierre Luigi, who will be talking to us about um, using uh, FluxNet observations for developing weather and climate model land surface schemes. Um, Pierre is a professor at the University of Reading and also uh, part of the NCAS. Uh, team at Reading. He's a director at the, of uh, research or lead scientist um, with the NCAS team uh, at Reading. Uh, Pierre. Thank you very much. So I'll um, give a talk a little bit as an outsider, um, having used FluxNet data for the last 20 years. And I want to show a little bit how we use the data for different purposes at different scales. So throughout the talk, I'll be talking about JULES, which is our um, land surface model here in the UK. So it's a joint UK land environment simulator, and it's used in our GCMs and also RCMs. It's used for weather, climate, anything you can imagine around the globe in both global and regional configurations um, has JULES at the bottom. Um, well, you know what land surface models are, so I can skip. But uh, just to say that, uh, We've been developing this model for, for a long time and lots of people have been using um, the model to attach new packages, new, new parameterizations, new treatments of radiation, ozone, you name it. And also uh, starting to do data simulation, simulating crops and uh, all sorts of complex earth system um, um, new capabilities. Um, and, and one of the things that have come up um, recently as people uh, develop these, these new capabilities is, is the base model any good? And uh, how does it stand internationally? So should I attach my science to such a base model or should I attach my science to, to something else? Um, and so we've been very much needing a, a definition of what JULES is from the point of view of a simulation system. So this comes with configurations, with, with initialization and all that. It's not just about code. So these scientific configurations are very important and I show a couple of them. And also the, the assessment is really important and that's where FluxNet really comes in and helps. So as I was, I was saying about the scientific configurations, these are very important. So there are certain things that we can do at the plot scale. And I think here there's a huge opportunity to develop processes in very high detail. And then there are um, sort of going up in scale uh, more, it, it, integrative spatial scale that could be treated with RCMs and particularly the new RCMs at one or two kilometers, there is all convection and can feed very high intensity winds and high intensity precipitation. Uh, we have also data sets to drive such models um, 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 over particular locations uh, for long periods of time and can also do urban landscapes and, and so on. And then we have the traditional GCM that is normally run globally and here our GCMs now are 10 kilometers. We are developing GCMs at two to three kilometers, but still we are dealing with some sort of mesoscale. So we're dealing with a whole landscape. And perhaps this is the, the, the place where we want to know the model is good, but we don't want to be developing the model. We want to stay here with model developments. But I'll show you these uh, sort of uh, scale jumps as, as we use uh, FluxNet data. So we have developed configurations for jewels. One of them is a FluxNet configuration. So it's cheap and versatile. Um, it's very, very easy to run um, and 
again, helps us to, to do model development. And then we have the, the global offline configuration that is normally driven uh, by uh, observed uh, weather, like WFDI data set at about half a degree, so 50 kilometers, let's say. Um, this allows us to run the land surface model without the typical errors in the GCM. And again, it's relevant at large scale, so with some sort of spatial integration. And the ensembles here are reasonably affordable. We have a large cluster in the UK. We can run many, many ensemble members. And it's reasonably easy to assess, especially now that Fluxnet has been embedded in so many assessment suites. So the, the Fluxnet products are available at comparable scales. And, and so the scale jump is done for us. And then we have a global coupled. And so this is very important to recognize that once we run uh, in, inside the GCM, we have also the issues with the errors of the GCM, so the biases, but also there are lots of feedbacks. So to figure out what the land surface is doing in the context of a global coupled model is very difficult. And I think this connection between being able to run offline, and this also means being able to extract the GCM atmosphere and repeat a land surface experiment with the same GCM, GCM atmosphere. So killing the possibility for, for feedbacks is very important. And so this interaction between these two at, at, at the global scale is very important. This one, I would say the global couple is the hardest to assess because of these feedbacks. The interpretation is really hard. And I think having all these three capabilities together is really important. And this is what we've been doing as a, as a community. Um, just to say that we have lots and lots of people using these models nowadays and sometimes just downloading the data sets where there are many, many applications over different scales. And again, being able to tell these end users how good or bad the model is, is crucial, but I'll, I'll skip this, it's not so interesting to you. Just to go back a little bit to the history. So we started to look at Fluxnet and make use of Fluxnet a long time ago when I was still in Switzerland with Reuter Stöckli. At the time we built a thing that we called the model farm. We had about 10 land surface models in it. And we were using the Fluxnet data of the time to understand what we should do with the treatment of soil moisture, how deep we should go, how many layers, what kind of uh, physics, whether we needed to have a water table or not. And at the time, so we had a few, a few sites around uh, Europe and we were very interested in seeing how different models, so this, this is the model we were developing at the time, that was SIB, SIB2 actually, and we had VAST, it was a previous generation, and we had a bucket model, and we were looking at things like the seasonal cycle of soil moisture in those different models against some observations that we had at these sites for the, the soil moisture, and showing that the bucket model was absolutely inadequate. We're trying to figure out how to treat the soils in uh, SIB and VATS. And uh, even in temperate and moist climates, uh, VATS was obviously behaving in a very crazy way, particularly from the point of view of the latent heat flux. The bucket model was way too permissive with um, the way it treated um, latent heat and then tended to run out in, in summer, uh, especially in dry and warm climates. So absolutely inadequate to, to uh, uh, be used for uh, simulating uh, European regional climate. But also we realized that at certain sites around Europe, it was very important to be able to simulate reasonably deep soils and to include a water table, which eventually we did. But the, the, the knowledge of what we needed to do with the regional model started here with these flux net sites. So that was nearly 20 years ago. Um, then I came to the UK and I started working with uh, Catherine Vandenhoff. This is from a paper that we published in 2012 in Agriculture and Forest Meteorology. Initially, she was working on uh, uh, simulating crops, but after the crop experience, we went back and we looked at the, at the base model and we used again lots of Fluxnet data. And at the time, we were very concerned with the way Jules treated transpiration and evaporation. So basically in the GCM, we could see that anytime we made any improvements in vegetation, what was happening is that the soil was compensating. There was too much uh, soil evaporation compared to what was observed and, and the importance of transpiration was way too little. And so again, we used the information from these Fluxnet sites to understand how we could improve the model so we would have a much better representation of what vegetation is doing versus the soils and to see whether we could kill off this in-box feedback between the soils and the vegetation that was masking the, the, the coupling processes in the GCM itself. And so we introduced a number of, of um, different treatments of how vegetation performs uh, photosynthesis and how then transpiration is affected by that and how we, we treated interception which had to do also with telescoping the soils 
and also how we treated in-store processes and then how we, we could combine all of those together. And it's only because we had all these very detailed Platznet data that told us what the partition should be. And also at some sites, we had a bit of information about what was going on under the surface that we could make this progress and then eventually apply these, this knowledge to the GCM itself. But again, it started with the Platznet data. Um, this has evolved then into a big working group. So a very large community has worked on, on this. We now have two, what we call suites. So this is a, an entire workflow that goes from setting up experiments and running them all the way to making plots, producing statistics. We have the small suite that has 80 plots net sites. And there, there's a recent publication that is in uh, GMD discussions that uh, shows the, what what the performance of a very large number of Joule's um, scientific setups is at these global sites. So it's in the Harper at all, 2021. And then we have a larger suite that has 170 sites. This is called Planet 2. This is uh, run by Helen Rumbold. Uses mostly Fluxnet 2015 and some other um, 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 affiliate sites. And this is nowadays always used to assess any new scientific change to Joules before it goes into the standard configurations. So this is one of the standard tests to run, to run Joules at least through the small one, if not, uh, and we aim eventually to have it run through all 170 sites and produce all sorts of statistics. This is an example of statistics. So here the 80 sites are, are lumped together in terms of plant functional types. These are the extended plant, plant functional types available in, uh, um, in joules nowadays, this is the, the, the normalized absolute error in GPP for these different functional types. And this is default joules, so our control. And then this is an example of what happens if we prescribe the soil moisture and or if we prescribe soil moisture and NAI. This paper has many, many more such experiments and you, I invite you to, to look at it to see what we've done. I would say that the most important uh, result from that uh, large uh, sensitivity study is that we do need to extend the Joule's uh, soils to at least 10 meters worldwide. And again, this is what we aim to do with the GCM next. But all of it was initially developed through the Fluxnet sites. Um, another example of use of um, um, Fluxnet data was in a, in a paper we published with uh, um, Ruther Peters at all in Nature Geoscience. We were looking at uh, the response to drought, this is, a, this is an example of a response to the 2003 drought. And in this case, I use the same experiment to look at what happens when we uh, force the um, soil moisture stress onto vegetation in different ways. So if we force soil moisture stress to affect um, photosynthesis or to affect stomatal conductance or to affect mesophyll conductance, or in fact, what happens if we use a combination of all these routes to um, plant um, reduced activity in, in a period of drought. And this is again here showing what the truth is from the point of view of a number of Fluxnet stations. And this shows us that if we include the, the water stress onto all of these processes, we, we have the, the best agreement in the observations. What if we, if we use the standard configuration of joules where we apply soil water stress just to assimilation of, of CO2, we have a completely wrong response. So the, the, the water use efficiency in the, in the air does not match observations. So this was again a, a quick way to, to check what it is that we're doing in a situation of stress. Um, I'm now going to go to the distributed joules just to say that in these in GC, GCM that each grid box we have quite a complex landscape, so a number of vegetation and functional types, and then bare ground, some water, and potentially also snow. And there could be also um, rocks and, and urban. I didn't include those. Uh, so the landscapes look, uh, look like this. And we need to make sure that we also sum up all the fluxes correctly. And as I was saying that before, that there is no artificial feedback between two of them. So that if we make an improvement here, then the other one takes over and, and masks the, the improvement. Um, in the old times, before we had the, these Fluxnet suites, we, because of the complexity of all this and the, the complexity of setting up all these landscapes, we tended to do such things in the GCM. This is an example of uh, redefining canopy height uh, globally. And uh, I ran this experiment a very long time ago. And uh, well, if, if, if 
we look at the 1.5 meter response, th there are some indications that yes, the model is sensitive to it, but I had to run this experiment for a very, very long amount of time in order to see any robustness in the results. And uh, I would say that I'm still not convinced that this was a, a good way to do it. Uh, I, I still would maintain the result is not robust. I should have run a big ensemble of such experiments, but I couldn't afford to do it. And I would say that for us, um, an important new development was the Jung et al. data set that started to take FluxNet data to a, a global scale. And this is now in, uh, in Fluxcom, and there's now going to be another Fluxcom. Um, so these products started to be incorporated in our assessment suites, and now they are in community suites like ILAM. And we are making much use of these, of these products together with anything else that is out there. But I like the fact that we have some products that are independent of reanalysis that are, no matter how much you trust or not trust these neural networks, they are not contaminated by another GCM like the, the reanalysis normally are. And uh, definitely, I think this is, this is a very important part of the assessment. So to go out to this, to this uh, half degree or, or, or 10 kilometer um, resolutions and, and reassess the models. Um, I have an example here of something that I did very recently. This paper is, is under review now. I was looking again at the treatment of um, the, the stress on vegetation. This is the GPP response and the evapotranspiration response. This is the annual response. This is our control model. And this is the, the, the one model that combines all the stomato, azofil, and assimilation routes for soil water stress. These are the different seasons so winter, spring, summer and uh, autumn. Um, and this shows what the bias is for the control jewels. And this is what the bias for this, this special treatment is for C6. Um, and this is the bias ratio that tells us whether or not we are improving the model. So we can use uh, special periods or special regions to help us understand at these larger scales what the impact is of, of changing a particular parameterization. This is for GPP and this is for drop transpiration. But we have incorporated as much as possible these flux com products into our assessment suites. And um, this is another example from uh, working with um, the ILAMB um, suite, which gives us this sort of traffic light um, response. So we have a number of joules experiments in the traffic light tells us wh whether one of those is a relative improvement, say, for sensible wheat or um, for GPP versus what we used to have. And as you can see, we, we can afford to run these experiments doing a number of, of years of spin-up, but also we can run the experiments many times over and we can try all sorts of combinations that are not possible in the GCM. And uh, well, the, the suite also produces Taylor diagrams and produces all sorts of statistics on, on, on the biases and uh, breaks them down into all sorts of much more sophisticated products and again gives it the, the traffic light uh, kind of information. So these metrics make it possible for us to quickly see what, what happens uh, when we run the model. So this is another one for GPP. And again, we have traffic light system tells us whether we are improving the model or we are we're going away from what we used to have in terms of model quality. Also, the, the system is able to produce uh, time series and to look at uh, seasonality, um, lots and lots of statistics. And I think this is really useful for, for our community. I have to say that something else we've been doing um, a lot is to introduce other independent assessments. And we've been working a lot with rivers. So we've been doing um, massive use of the, of the global river network to assess what the impact is of changes on the land surface in terms of uh, an integral of uh, P minus E and, and looking at uh, long-term um, discharge for, again for different joules configurations and we've also been connecting this to land atmosphere coupling so for some of these rivers we see that as we change the model and or as we change the resolution of the parent GCM and we tend to do this by extracting the atmosphere of the parent GCM, not running uh, all the time coupled. We then look at what the integration through the river network tells us, because that tends to also make up for the lack of suitable observations of precipitation, but particular of evaporation in certain areas of the world where the observation is sparse. Uh, the rivers are one way to sort of uh, 
get away from the problem of not knowing in detail on the grid what P minus E is. So this is complementary to all the other types of assessment that we do. Um, so just to, to summarize what we've been doing with flux net observations. So we use them at site level over a very large number of sites. So the minimum is 80 and the current maximum is 170 to look at processes in detail. And an example was the transpiration versus evaporation from the soils, which can lead to very specific model development. So this is prior to putting things together. Then in distributed offline mode, the typical application is global at half a degree. And this is to understand what happens if we couple the model to the atmosphere, but we deny some of the feedbacks. So under idealized conditions, and this could be with observed meteorology or the meteorology extracted with the GCM. And here we try to test the combined effects of model development. So we introduce them one by one, but then we also run with all of the model developments pieced together. And finally, when all of this is done and we have good knowledge of all of these things, we run in couple modes. So we run within a GCM in which the feedbacks are now enabled. And, and then we need to run fewer number of experiments because we have the robust, robustness from these two steps. Um, so as I, as I was saying before, three does not make sense in isolation. I think these two steps are really necessary. So in this sense, and because the, the FluxNet data are embedded in standard assessment suites, not just our own, but community ones that are available internationally, so I think FluxNet has been immensely beneficial to the GCM community. And I have here something that I think is missing. So I will say that not enough sites uh, have a complete set of variables. I was very pleased to, to see today a lot more on uh, availability of transpiration. But um, for instance, uh, I, I'm looking now at what's available in Europe because we are designing a new campaign over, over the Alps. And there are still quite a few sites that don't have much information about what's happening under the, uh, the surface. So, so temperature, soil moisture and profiles, but also the spatial sampling. So the spatial sampling around the FluxNet tower uh, is still very much lacking. If, 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 if much, there is just one profile and it would be important to have a, a collection of profiles around the tower. Um, I'm, at least for Europe, I've seen now that US is still strong on um, agriculture, for instance, but in Europe, I think there are not enough sites on, in, in managed biomes, so forests that are managed and agricultural sites, but also the distinction between irrigated sites and, and sites that uh, uh, re rely on, on, uh, on, on pluvial inputs of, of water. Um, and it would be very nice to have, um, with, this, with very similar, if not the same atmospheric conditions, to have a pair of natural versus managed, very much coexisting so that we can verify the impact of management on, on fluxes and on the evolution of what's going on underground. Um, the, other, the other aspect for us is that it's important that these sites are maintained uh, long-term. So I see that some of the sites are very old and it's, it's, it's good to see they are maintained. Uh, I hope that the ones that are new will be maintained for decades because we need these over our climatological time scale. And then yes, connection to our measurements, and I showed an example of river networks, which are integrators, and, and these are important where the data are sparse, and this can help us understand whether or not we are doing a good job constraining what it is that we find, both in these um, uh, machine learning or uh, neural network exercises and with, with the GCMs, which are physical interpolators. And uh, I'll stop here. All right. Thank you, uh, Pierre. Um, just to remind everybody that if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat, uh, and then we would um, Pierre will, will will deal with those um, before we get to the Q and A session at the end. Okay, I'm trying to find the right window for that. Um... Do I have the right window? I don't see any questions. Ah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we've so got- there is a question. Uh, yeah, I, found it. I found it now. There is a question. How do large scale models such as dual seed land management determine their results? So we, 
we can we can impose those things. We we certainly put in information about landscape, and it can be static or it can be uh, time changing. Um, there are places where we have this information at very high resolution and at high frequency. We can impose that. Um, we do have um, the ability to run with um, uh, dynamic vegetation and or to impose certain types of disturbances through the uh, dynamic vegetation. Um, of course, um, that all depends on the quality of the dynamic vegetation and the modules like fire or other things that, that go in. But many, many of such models are added every year. And again, they go through the whole chain of uh, assessment. So first the model is tested in just physical mode, and then these extra packages are switched on one by one to have traceability as we go to this larger complexity and look at what the impacts are of switching on each one of those um, extra packages or extra earth system modeling uh, components. Um, then there was another question, just uh, going to move to data. Is there any one data set so viable that you give priority to in terms of evaluation? Well, no, um, we tend to look at all the components of the energy balance uh, we look, tend to look at things that uh, are important for the carbon cycle. Um, we, we look then at all the prognostic variables that will affect the GCM itself from the point of view of the evolution of the boundary layer. So surface temperature, um, anything that has to do with the uh, removal of momentum, and of course the, um, the, the boundary conditions for uh, moisture and, uh, and what is returned to the atmosphere in terms of a, a long wave um it is all important uh, we 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 need to know that if we do something very clever with the land surface it's not going to compromise the quality of the basic atmospheric variables like temperature precipitation winds and all that um, so it is important we have assessment packages that are comprehensive and really look at energy water momentum and carbon and these are, these are all the prognostic variables and all the fluxes. Then for climate, it's also important that we look at the long-term evolution of what's underground. And so it's, it's profiles of soil temperature, profiles of soil moisture, but also what is frozen and what is not frozen. Uh, those are also really important variables for us. Um, is there any particular variable you think um, should be measured which um, is currently not available either in terms of um, the special coverage or just not available at all? So, see, I don't follow this enough to know, but the other day as I was interacting with the European Luxnet community that is part of this new campaign, I was asking whether they, because we are going, at, um, we're going from the, the, the valleys to the south and to the north of the Alps to very high elevation, I was asking whether they, they know where the water table is, and also whether they know where the, the soil is frozen. And, and quite a few of them said they didn't know. And, and for us, again, because we are running these uh, climate models long-term and, and, and very much at uh, high resolu resolution nowadays, which means we are resolving all that elevation change, it is important to know where the, the soil is frozen and where the water table is. Okay. Yes, um, so there is another question about water tables. Um, so we do have some um, alternative models. One of them is top model. And then we have something a bit newer than that. Um, definitely we can switch those modules on and they do become important as we start to go to high resolution and the slopes become significant. Um, of course, those are very crude models and uh, any hydrologist would, would do something quite different, but then they would do it at completely different scales that we cannot afford. Uh, but yes, we do have modules that we can switch on. So recently we've been working with um, some new, in a different project that I didn't show here, we've been working with a, um, a new capability uh, to simulate irrigation and for certain locations, unless we work with both uh, the irrigation and the water table, the results are very much unrealistic. Um, ah, so, how many layers of soil is reasonable for modeling crops such as soybeans and corn surface models? So I 
have to say that we have uh, with, with Catherine, we've only simulated wheat. And then later we've done um, some other crops like cocoa, but uh, there are people in the UK uh, like Camilla, um, oh, I always forget her last name. Um, uh, uh, this is a person at the Met Office and Leeds. Um, she has many papers nowadays on uh, running the full agricultural model. Uh, in, in my opinion, some of the things I've seen in the response of these models, particularly for the, the seasonal cycle, the four layers that we use in jewels are not enough. So we have a suggestion in this paper with Anna Harper that we should be using um, many more layers and going down to 10 meters. And I think for some of these um, fast evolutions throughout the seasonal cycle, that should improve the simulation of some of these, of these features. Um, many of these that you mentioned do not have such deep roots, but on the other hand, having a, a, a realistic stimulation of the soil water profile, a more continuous simulation of soil water profile, I think is important even for the agricultural crops. And even more importantly, if we then, then switch on the irrigation, which usually goes along, not, not in Europe maybe, but in other parts of the world, that goes along with uh, agriculture. Okay, um, thank you very much, Pierre, for that uh, interesting talk. Um, we'll now move on to uh, our next speaker, um, Cynthia, if, you, if you're ready. So Cynthia is with the um, uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory, and she would be speaking to us about water fluxes uh, in, on, or and out of leaves. How do you the position affects um, plant transpiration. Cynthia. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you for, uh, to the organizers for uh, having me um, for this meeting. Uh, the FluxNet community is sort of more adjacent, I would say, to my work. I haven't really directly worked. Um, um, I sort of don't consider myself usually to be part of the, the FluxNet community. Um, so it's great to get a chance to kind of connect a little more um, with everybody. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about dew deposition and how it changes water fluxes, um, as the title say, in, on, and out of leaves. And uh, the first thing that I like to uh, start with is uh, what exactly is dew? Um, the dictionary definition is that dew is moisture condensed upon the surfaces of cool bodies, especially at night. Um, so it's essentially water that is in the shape of water vapor in the air that usually um, in the early morning when the air temperature starts rising, but surfaces tend to stay cooler, um, essentially condenses out of the uh, vapor phase and onto the liquid phase at those, uh, on those surfaces. And it turns out that leaves are very good at, um, at cooling down and at, at, at radiating uh, heat uh, out. So they tend to be um, a great place for dew to deposit. But different leaves have very different um, surfaces and that affects how dew um, deposits on those, those leaves. So here are three pictures that I've taken myself. Um, on the left is a tomato leaf that has trichomes, a little hair at the surface, and that really um, traps very small uh, droplets of dew. And then in the center is a rose leaf that um, is very waxy. And so the dew droplets tend to kind of coalesce together to make bigger, bigger um, droplets. And then finally, um, in the far right is a, a succulent. I'm not completely sure what kind it is, but it's very, very waxy and kind of makes all the water um, beat up and then roll down. And so you can sort of see all that is left from the dew is this one single very large droplet of water. Um, it turns out that uh, dew essentially is, um, um, will deposit based on temperature, air temperature and surface temperature, relative humidity and wind speed. Those are sort of the three main factors for whether or not you are going to have dew. And those three parameters are um, predicted to be highly, um, highly changed by um, climate change and global warming in general. And here I'm showing you um, work by uh, Blanenka Tomasevic, who used two different models. And so the top one and then 
bottom one, and then um, two different climate scenarios, so RCP 4.5, a little bit more optimistic, and then RCP 8.5, to look at what dew deposition might look like, focusing on the Mediterranean basin. And everything that is in the red shades um, is a decrease in dew deposition, and everything that is in the green shades is in the positive, so increase in dew deposition. And you can see that out of the um, four different sort of uh, model and climate and climate scenario combination, um, only one of them has essentially a no change in duty position. All the other ones have a decrease in duty position. Um, we also have some um, evidence from experiments that indeed warming is going to be decreasing due to position. And this paper here by Peng and all looked at uh, due duration in a control and in a warming experiment. And they saw that warming decreases the amount of time that there was due at the surface of vegetation. So of course, if the air is warmer, then um, this water is going to evaporate faster, but also the due amount. So there was less dew that would deposit um, initially at the surface of different, um, different species that they tested. And this is very important because dew deposition is, um, as we'll see later on, very important for um, specific species. Now, one thing um, that I think some of you might think is that, well, dew is, is not that much water, especially compared to fog or uh, rainfall. And that is true in, in a lot of places. Um, and here I'm showing you um, annual dew amounts for a few different locations and then annual um, rainfall for the same locations. And what you can see is that, especially in sort of more temperate, Climates and this is these are still very dry um, dry ecosystems, but um, you have rain up to about you know 450 millimeters um, here, whereas the dew is at around 10 to 20 millimeters per year, so it's not much. But then you have other locations, usually very dry um, ecosystems, where um, you have only you know less than 100 millimeters of rain, and then you have up to 50 millimeters of dew. Um, and I just want to use this as an example. It's obviously an extreme example, but um, of dew deposition being um, essentially a comparable source of water as rain can be. Um, and the very important thing about dew is that it is uh, often a very regular source of water. It happens every morning, almost everywhere. And so that is important for vegetation because a reliable, even if it's a small source of water, if it's reliable, it can be used uh, more efficiently by, by vegetation. We have a lot of um, indication at this point that dew is used for uh, by plants. Um, here is an example of how um, leaf, um, so, um, I'm sorry, a leaf water potential is changing between um, a drought stress with no dew, which are the green dots, and then drought stress with dew deposition, the orange dots. Um, and essentially the authors concluded that since there was an increase in leaf water potential, leaf water potential essentially, essentially tells you about um, the, the water stress of a plant, um, to put it simply. And so, uh, the more negative, the more stressed the plant is. And so if um, there was dew deposited on the plants, they saw a decrease in that stress essentially. And they um, concluded that uh, dew deposition was maybe coming in through the trichomes, so the little hair at the surface of the plants and getting into the leaves. Um, and I will be arguing that maybe that is not necessarily what is happening, um, even though clearly dew is important here for the vegetation. In this other experiment here, um, the authors used um, did a five week long drought experiment and um, they exploited, exploited, exposed different species to three, five or seven days um, of dew deposition per week. And after four weeks, they looked at the increase in biomass. Um, and what they saw is that the more dew the plants are receiving in the strat experiment, um, the larger the change in biomass. And again, they use that as evidence that maybe water was coming into the leaves, although there was sort of no direct um, proof that this was actually happening. So just to conclude a little bit this introduction, um, dew deposition is expected to decrease because of climate change. 
Um, it does represent a significant source of water for some ecosystems. Uh, compared to fog, fog is, um, tends to be very site specific. We have some places that get a lot of fog and then other places that don't really get any. And even rainwater in some places. It's also regular and reliable, which is something that is very important for plants. Some species we know are able to take directly water from their leaf, which is called foliar uptake. Um, we have evidence from fog uh, using stable isotopes. Um, but whenever there is a result that really just shows an increase in um, leaf water potential or um, sort of different parameters that are not directly linked to actual composition of the water, that is not proof that there's actually been water traced into the leaf, um, there might be a different explanation for how dew water is interacting with the water cycle. Specifically, how dew is interacting with the energy cycle of leaves, which is what I'm going to be telling you about right now. So um, dew deposition um, happens, as I was saying, mostly in the, um, at night or in the early morning. So this is my moon up here, here's my leaf, and then those are my very um, poorly drawn stomata. Stomata are the openings at the bottom of the leaves that let CO2 into the leaves and in the process um, tend to let water out of the leaf. So um, it's nighttime and the air temperature is um, higher than the leaf temperature because we're about to, um, to get to the morning. The stomata are still closed because it's night and we have dew that deposits on the surface of the leaf. The fact that we have this water depositing on the leaf actually brings energy into the leaf and that increases the leaf temperature. And then the sun comes up and it starts warming up the leaf very quickly. The stomata open up because um, now that there's sun, they can start uh, photosynthesizing. And so we have um, CO2 that can come into the leaf and water that might uh, leave the leaf as transpiration. Because of the sun, the dew droplets evaporate. And by the process of evaporation is, is essentially taking energy out of the leaf and decreasing leaf temperature. And I'm gonna essentially spare you all the equations, but this is essentially what we modeled. We modeled um, taking some basic met data of air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed. We uh, modeled the deposition of dew droplets at the surface of a leaf. And then as the sun comes up and stomata start opening, we model um, how the effect of the dew droplets at the surface of the leaf impacted um, the energy balance of the leaf. And as a consequence, the water fluxes and the CO2 fluxes in and out of the leaves. So um, this is a quick example of what this model looks like for the dew deposition itself. And in red is, uh, the actual model results. And then in black are the data from leaf wetness sensors that were installed at the Blue Oak Ranch Reserve, which is a UC Berkeley um, field station. And you can kind of see them right there. You have those three little leaves attached um, right there. And this is what the data we use to compare to our model. These are two different events, but we had many events um, over a few years. And what you can see is that the model does a pretty good job at modeling the timing of the dew. So this is just time, so 6 p.m. and then midnight, 6 a.m. noon. So the timing of the dew is pretty well captured as well as the actual amount of dew that deposited at the surface of the leaves. So um, we're pretty happy with our model. We calibrated our leaf witness sensors and now we essentially take this model to look at how um, transpiration becomes affected by dew deposition. So here on the x-axis is the amount of dew at dawn. So um, this is when the stomata open up and we start uh, having CO2 in and water out of the leaves. So um, we, increase, we look at how, if we have just a little bit of dew versus a lot of dew, how does that change things? And then, um, the x-axis here is, the, sorry, the y-axis here is the change in transpiration. So the decrease in transpiration compared to a dry leaf. And then those uh, four different lines are different sizes of leaves. 
And so what you can see is that as the leaf size increases, so from one centimeter here to 50 centimeter leaf here, which is a very big leaf, more sort of a tropical um, type of um, vegetation, we have an increase in transpiration suppression all the way down to almost 30% decrease in transpiration for um, a large leaf um, with a lot of dew at the surface. The reason for um, this variation with uh, leaf size is that um, smaller leaves tend to be sort of um, more uh, in tune with, with the actual environmental conditions. And so the water at the surface is going to evaporate faster, whereas larger leaves um, essentially tend to have a, a thicker boundary layer. And so it's going to sort of say moisture right around the leaf and the water is actually going to stick around on the leaf for longer, which is how we get this um, increased effect. It's essentially a timing difference. Um, the small leaf um, becomes dry much faster than the large leaf. The interesting thing though, is that when we actually model assimilation for the same um, leaves, we also get a similar effect with um, smaller leaves. First of all, we see a decrease in assimilation. So leaves aren't trying to take advantage of the lack of transpiration to sort of take up a lot of CO2 and, and, and sort of assimilate it very fast. Um, we actually see a decrease. And what we think is happening is actually that the decrease in temperature is affecting um, essentially the, the photosynthesis um, apparatus, which is sort of tuned for a very optimal temperature. And so as you decrease this temperature, photosynthesis isn't just um, happening as well as it would if the leaf was just a little warmer. We did look at what exactly contributes most to this, to this transpiration suppression effect. And um, again, these are my five, my four leaf sizes. And you see that leaf temperature is really the driving factor in this transpiration suppression. And as I said, we also, um, we also think that it is the main driver for the decrease in assimilation. There's a little bit of, um, of an effect from albedo, so actually reflection from the leaf from being sort of shiny and it reflects more um, of the sun when it's wet than when it's not. And what I call combinatory effects, which is just the combination of leaf albedo um, and leaf temperature. Emissivity, which is the, the ability um, to sort of radiate heat, um, doesn't really get modified so much between a wet and a dry leaf. And so that was not um, as big of, a, of an effect here. Finally, the real question is, well, if the climate warms, how is this going to change? So here I'm showing you transpiration, CO2 assimilation, and dew duration for a range of wind speeds and relative humidities to kind of get a sense for what the space looks like. And then I'm going to show you the same plot here with air temperature increased by five degrees. And I don't know if I can, yeah, I can toggle back and forth. And what you can see, it's too far, is that when we add five degrees to the air temperature, the dew duration really decreases. And as a result, we really start having, um, and so, so you pay attention to sort of the, for example, um, larger leaf here, transpiration, CO2 assimilation. Um, the colors essentially start um, to become bluer if we have um, a higher temperature. What that means is that we don't, we start having more transpiration essentially as we go towards the bluer colors. So that transpiration suppression effect um, with climate with climate change, with global warming is, is expected to um, essentially decrease. Um, part of it is the change in due duration, part of it is the temperature. So a quick summary of this first section, dew is decreasing transpiration and assimilation in leaves. This is mainly driven by the cooling from dew evaporating from the surface of the leaf and rising air temperatures due to climate change will decrease leaf wetness duration and lower the decrease in transpiration and assimilation due to dew deposition. Now, all of this was a modeling experiment and it would be nice to actually have some um, evidence from sort of real life that this is um, actually happening. And to do so, we use stable isotopes. I just want to give everybody a quick refresher um, in stable isotopes. So in case you haven't really used them before, um, just give you a quick introduction on how we can use them to look at water in plants. So here is a table of isotopes. 
Um, isotopes are um, elements that have the same number of uh, protons, but a different number of neutrons. Um, a classic one is carbon-14. Um, I think a lot of people um, know this one. So we have carbon-12, which is sort of our classic version of carbon, and then carbon-14, which is an isotope of um, carbon-12. For water, we're going to focus on um, two specific isotopes. So um, the first one is deuterium, which is the version of hydrogen that has two neutrons. And so we're going to be using our classic version of hydrogen with one neutron and then our um, deuterium with two. And then, sorry, with one. <laughs> and then um, the um, second one is oxygen. So oxygen 16 is our um, classic version of oxygen and then oxygen 18 um, with two extra neutrons is um, sort of the classic stable isotopes used for uh, water studies. Oxygen 17 is becoming a lot more used and we have much better instruments with much better precision that are really allowing us to make use of it. But um, for this specific study, we only use um, oxygen 18. All the red isotopes here are radioactive and the yellow ones are um, stable, I forgot to mention. In terms of abundance, um, oxygen 18 is about 0.2% of oxygen on Earth. Oxygen 17 is 0.04% and the rest is essentially oxygen 16. Hydrogen, um, so deuterium is 0.015%, so even less. Um, and in the study, we're going to use three different uh, versions of water, if you like, which are called isotopologues. H2O16, which is the sort of normal version, the light version of water. And then um, H2O18, which is um, the version of water where we've switched the oxygen for the heavy version of oxygen, O18. And then H1H2O16, um, which is the version of water where we've kept the oxygen at um, 16. We've kept one of the hydrogen to be normal and then one of the hydrogen is uh, deuterium. Uh, combinations of multiple um, heavy isotopes are possible. They are much more rare um, and sort of used for uh, different applications. Um, we have, so if we have a pool of water with sort of a mixture of these three different isotope blocks, we have phenomena that essentially start um, differentiating um, between the different isotopes. So the first one is um, diffusion effects. So um, essentially the light isotopes, and here I'm showing you an example with O18 and O16. So the version with O16, which is lighter, is capable of diffusing much faster in the air than um, O18. And so what that means is that if we have um, a diffusion process over time, the pool that, um, that the water is coming from is essentially going to be um, depleted in this uh, O16, which is just going to diffuse faster away from um, whatever you're looking at. So um, to give you an idea, the diff diffusivity of H2O16 in the air is about 1.28 times that of um, H2O18. And then the second uh, difference is vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is essentially the ability to break free from um, the water phase or the liquid phase into the vapor phase. And again, um, our lighter versions of isotopes um, tend to be um, tend to have a, an easier time breaking free of the liquid phase and going into um, the vapor phase. So what that means is that, again, we're going to stay um, with a lot more heavy enriched isotopes left behind in the, the liquid phase. So those two phenomena combines essentially lead to leaves being in general much more enriched in um, heavy isotopes, so O18 or deuterium. A quick note on notations, unfortunately, um, Isotopes are usually given as the ratio of the rare isotope log, so H2O18 or H1H2O16 over the common one. And then we take this ratio R here, this is the ratio of our standard, and then um, we compare it to the ratio of a standard, RST, and this gives us a delta value, which is what um, isotope studies usually report. Those values are um, usually given in per mil because it's very small numbers. And so kind of, 
going back to um, you know, a pool of water, for example, here, where we have a lot of, um, we have a pool of water, we let it evaporate, and we have a lot of heavy isotopes left in the pool. So all the OE16 have evaporated, everything left behind is O18. We're going to say that the water in the pan is enriched or heavier because it has more 18 than at the start. And the pan um, at the end will have a higher delta value than at the beginning because if you look, um, our R essentially um, has um, increased compared to uh, the R we had at the beginning of the experiment before all the O16 evaporated. And that essentially is what happens in leaves as well. So in leaf, we have both the evaporation effect as well as the diffusion through the stomata, and both of these essentially lead to enriched water inside of leaves. So we did an isotope experiment on very large leaf um, elephant ears. This was my um, undergraduate um, student, um, Craig, who worked with me on this experiment. And uh, you can sort of get a sense for how big this leaf is. And here you see how we sampled it to create essentially maps of the isotope um, inside the leaf. And here is the result that we got. So we took those leaves and then we sprayed some of the leaves with um, dew that was enriched in spit stabilized loops just to make sure we had no foliar uptake and then um, some controls. And what you can see is that um, we have much lighter color, much more um, higher delta values for both O18 and deuterium um, for the control than we have for the leaf that was wetted with uh, dew deposition. And so what that means is that we had more evaporation happening, more transpiration happening in the control leaf than we did in the dew wetted leaf. Because we used enriched water, we know for sure that no water actually went into the leaf. Um, and that this is all, again, an, an energy balance uh, modification of the leaf as opposed to an actual um, input of water into the leaf. The difference in isotopic composition is consistent with about 30% drop in transpiration, which is what we had uh, seen in the model. Finally, effect on water potential. Um, we did a somewhat similar experiment where we took these big leaves and then we um, cut them and let them dry out um, on, on the bench and monitored the leaf water potential, as I was telling you, which kind of tells you about um, the leaf uh, water stress. And some of the leaves were, were sprayed with water, some weren't. And what we saw is that we get this dramatic drop in water potential when the leaf is not misted where, or dew. Whereas uh, when we do have water at the surface, we do not have this drop at all. Um, and essentially dew wetted leaves were able to maintain the leaf water potential during this drying experiment, um, even though the control um, did not. And this result is very similar to what um, some of this um, other work claim as um, support for foliar uptake. And so this is maybe a word of caution that um, there's clearly a combination, there might be a combination of effects of both foliar uptake and, um, and energy balance effects of dew on vegetation. So just to summarize, uh, dew deposition modifies the energy cycle of leaves. Wetness decreases leaf temperature, therefore decreasing temperature, transpiration and assimilation. The decrease in transpiration leads to higher leaf water potential and could be in part confused with the effects of foliar uptake or um, maybe a combination of both. And climate change will likely decrease dew deposition, therefore increasing drought stress on vegetation, even in species that do not do foliar uptake. So if we know that there's no foliar uptake, um, we now have evidence that um, leaf might still be using them or still sort of um, gaining from due deposition in a way that uh, we maybe hadn't um, realized. And this is very important for um, ecosystems that um, rely uh, heavily on due deposition. Um, I just want to quickly thank my collaborators, Kelly Keller, my um, PhD advisor at the time when I did this work, um, as well as um, NASA, who funded um, my fellowship when I did this work as well. And I can be reached uh, both by email and on Twitter, and I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for uh, that insightful talk. Um, again, if, if anybody has any questions, uh, please put them in the chats uh, so that Cynthia can address them 
uh, while we prepare to go into our breakout sessions. Um, so we have a question for you. Uh, is there any influence of dew moisture directly covering stomata? That's limiting gas exchange overall. Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's something that you probably see, for example, in grasses that tend to have some on both sides of the of the leaf and that the leaves tend to be very, um, um, very vertical. Um, dew deposition actually really tends to only happen on the surface that is looking at the sky because um, emissivity matters a lot. I mean, the change in emissivity didn't matter um, for sort of dew deposition, but it matters for you just coming in. Um, and so having sort of a full view of the sky, having a clear sky matters a lot. And so the, the, um, the lower side of the leaf really don't tend to get much dew. Um, so in theory, again, there are some uh, specific cases where I think this would indeed uh, matter. Um, but I think this is sort of a, a smaller, uh, a smaller portion of, of leaves that would have that problem. Um, um, we have another one. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so empirical functions of dew intercepted by different types of vegetation are similar to those for rain interception. Um, so in terms of effects, uh, I think they are very, um, so I'm, I'm not sort of um, fully sure um, sort of uh, what you mean in terms of similarity, but um, in terms of the effect for sure, I think a lot of this work applies um, to rain interception. Um, one big difference is that you tend to have a lot of dew when you have a very clear sky that leads to then when the sun comes up to a very um, sort of bright sun um, with, you know, more assimilation happening, whereas, uh, and more transpiration. Whereas um, if you have rain and you have sort of a cloudy day, then you might have a lot sort of less um, activity from the leaf. Um, and so I think that's just the one aspect that I would probably maybe make the effects of, um, you know, rain interception on um, leaf water and, and, and CO2 flux is a little bit um, smaller, um, but you also have a lot more rain happening all over the world. And so I think it's, it's something that, yeah, um, that is obviously very important and I haven't really looked into. Um, I think again, also the effects of, actual wetness at the bottom of the leaf becomes maybe a bigger issue as well with rain than with dew. Um, I think Hausen is asking uh, if you have any suggestions on how um, we could measure uh, dew or leaf wetness in the field. Yeah, um, and I'm, so I'm actually currently setting up a, a new field site at Point Reyes in California, and um, I was sort of looking into this, and it seems like leaf wetness sensors are still our best guess at this point. So we're just having leaf wetness sensors kind of interspaced within uh, vegetation. Um, it's not ideal, but it's a little bit, um, it seems to be the best continuous way of measuring um, dew. Um, you know, there are some ways of sort of um, kind of collecting dew and um, those kind of things, but those are a lot more um, time and, and, and sort of um, work consuming. And so you can't really do this. Yeah, the continuous aspects, I think, is only leaf witness services can help with, with that. Um, yeah, the next question is asking uh, if dew deposition increases uh, assimilation. I think you showed a slide where uh, there was an increase in biomass. Um, for, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I guess it is a little bit of trajectory. Um, I think what it, you know, I think that other experiment was sort of looking at a much longer time scale. Um, it was looking at over a month, um, so increase in biomass over a month. And so an increase in biomass um, when you had dew um, than when you didn't have dew. And so I think. Um, at that point, you know, we were looking at really sort of a, a time scale of a few hours, you know, while we have dew on it. Um, I think when you look over a month, then you start having um, sort of the balance of 
Um, well, if your plant has um, maintained um, its water status and is less stressed because it had a decrease in transpiration because of dew, then it can stay, um, the stomata can stay open later in the day and you can sort of having, I think that the transpiration decrease effect might actually start um, sort of balancing um, the, the lack in, in assimilation over those longer time periods. Um, but that's a really good point actually that I um, hadn't really um, thought about how those two were, um, might seem actually a little contradictory, but um, again, I think it's more of the balance between the transpiration and um, the assimilation on, on longer uh, time periods. Yeah, a um, couple more. If someone is starting a project to measure uh, dew deposition, what, what would you advise? What are the essentials? Um, you know, in terms of, so if you're starting, you know, a project in the field, I think the basics are, again, I think leaf wetness sensors are uh, great. Um, and then um, having some basic met data um, available so that you can really um, get a sense for when you actually hit uh, the dew point. And um, um, I think those are sort of the two main things. Um, but um, yeah, I would be happy to chat about sort of more details of uh, specific ideas. Um, uh, I lost track of the chat, sorry. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, does dew or fog work in the other direction for uh, redwood from outside of stomata or to inside? Um, yeah, so we have, um, the, I mean, there's been a lot of work by um, Todd Dawson. Yeah, maybe, maybe just so you can add this, why, why is the deposition so high in Israel? Yes. Um, well, this one is, is um, uh, I think, a little easier. I mean, I think Israel is essentially um, coastal. I think there's a big effect of just um, moisture coming in from uh, from. The ocean from the Mediterranean. So there isn't so much rainfall, but I think there's a decent amount of moisture in the air that then um, deposits. Um, it's pretty amazing actually how much dew there is in Israel. And there's a lot of project to actually harvest dew for like water use, not for plants, but for people. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty incredible place for dew deposition. And then <clears throat> for the redwoods, um, we do have evidence. So a lot of work by Todd Dawson um, that really has shown that there is, um, you know, fog coming into, um, into the needles. And so really, um, actual full uptake, um, of fog, um, does it, you know, is it happening for you? Uh, maybe, but, um, you know, in, in that area, there is so much fog that, um, your balance of sort of water input from dew versus water input from fog became, becomes a little bit, um, I think that the fog becomes a much more prominent feature of water resources for, for those, those plants. Okay, um, one more question before we go into the breakout sessions. Uh, uh, I think, is there any soil moisture effect that uh, compensates decrease in uh, dew deposition with, with climate change? Um, So if soil moisture is supplied to plants from deep soil, then the effects of dew division decrease could be reduced. Um, so maybe, I mean, my sense is that, you know, soil moisture is likely going to be decreasing, decreasing as well. Um, at least surface soil moisture for, um, for uh, with climate change. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a bit of a, difference whether you're talking about, um, you know, grasses versus trees that have access to uh, deeper um, water supplies. But um, my sense is that soil moisture would probably not really compensate that. Um, you know, the effects of, um, one of the, the effects that we're not completely sure which way it goes is you increase temperature, but you, uh, you might do your air might be able to hold more water. So having higher relative humidity, 
Um, again, based on the models I show, based on some of the work from my colleagues, um, it seems like there's still overall a decrease in due to position as expected. Um, but um, again, I, I, my sense is that soy mushroom will not help, but um, I haven't looked into it and I don't think I've really seen anyone work on it specifically either. So um, that's a good question. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, we would soon go into um, our breakout sessions. There will be four breakout uh, sessions. Um, each focusing on on a different topic. Um, so we, we are looking at where are the intersections and opportunities for flux measurement, modeling, and remote sensing. That would be one uh, topic. What measurements can remote sensing and flux towers provide for modelers to better estimate water processes um, and vice versa? Uh, what works and what needs to be improved? Um, these are some of the questions that we would be uh, treating in the breakout session. So uh, in a moment, Gilberto would uh, send us all into different breakout rooms and we can continue um, the discussions from there. If I can add just one last thing, um, please do elect somebody to give that breakout report at the end. Um, and then also stick around for a group picture. If you're comfortable turning your camera on, we'd love to get a, you know, capture this moment, right? Um, so enjoy the breakouts. Cool. Just before we jump in, yeah, you can unmute now and uh, turn on your video for the discussions. So let's get started. I'll, I'll stay in the main room if anyone has any questions or any trouble getting to the breakouts. Let's uh, jump into that. 